Hello, good evening, and welcome to the Schlocky Horror Picture Show. I'm your host, Nigel Honeybone. Imagine waking up in an English hospital after having eye surgery to discover the world's population had been ravaged by unstoppable flesh-eating monsters. And if that's not a bad enough way to start the day, there lurks terror from beyond at the bottom of the garden path. No doubt some of you out there with shorter memories are thinking, good lord, Nigel's going to screen 28 days later. Well, you'd be half right. The good lord, Nigel's going to screen half. Director Danny Boyle told me he was inspired to make 28 Days Later in 2002 after watching tonight's Gold Class presentation. So get your green thumb out of your ass and don your gardening gloves and grab the popcorn sprinkled with weed killer. Sit back and relax as we absorb by osmosis the 1962 science fiction flick tease, The Day of the Triffids. And please don't tell my mother I work for community television. It'd be too embarrassing. She thinks I clean toilets in a brothel. <clears throat> they creep and crawl and will hunt you down from the great beyond until you scream in terror. And then after the commercial break, I'll be back with the remains of the day of the Triffids. Isn't that an Anthony Hopkins film? <laughs> In nature's scheme of things, there are certain plants which are carnivorous, or eating plants. The Venus flytrap is one of the best known of these plants. A fly, drawn to the plant by a sweet syrup, brushes against trigger bristles. Just how these plants digest their prey has yet to be explained. There is much still to learn about these fascinating eating plants. This is a newcomer, Trifidus celestus, brought to Earth on the meteorites during the day of the Triffids. confirm that the world is witnessing an unprecedented shower of meteorites. There is no record of a display such as this in recorded history. At observatories, astronomers are noting this fantastic phenomenon and are carefully calculating the effect on our solar system. The consensus of opinion is that the meteorites burn up from the intense heat before they reach the Earth.
of the state. The share of meteorites continues unabated. This is a thrilling once-in-a-lifetime spectacle that simply must be seen. Once-in-a-lifetime spectacle. Free tickets. Take any seat in the house. Here I am. Here's Dr. Soames to see you, Mr. Mason. Hmm. Look, Doctor, hmm? why can't I take a look at what's going on outside? You're going to take the bandages off in the morning anyway. I'm afraid not, Mr. Mason. After an eye operation such as yours, it's best to wait the full ten days. Oh. Eight o'clock tomorrow morning, Nurse Jefferson. Yes, Doctor. Eight o'clock. Well, have a good night, Mr. Mason. Thank you. See you in the morning, I hope. I hope so. I'll have that cigarette. Hmm? Open your mouth, please. Ah. Uh. Now, this should give you a good night's rest. Lie back, Mr. Mason. <clears throat> I'm going to put your bed down. Miss Jameson, are you really as pretty as they say you are? By tomorrow morning, you'll be able to answer that question for yourself. Mm, tomorrow morning. Do you really think I'll be able to see? By tomorrow night, you'll be in Southampton, on board your ship, and ready for duty. Aye, aye, ma'am. Good night. Good night. program to remind you that the spectacular display of meteorites is still turning the night sky into a blazing display of fireworks. All over the world at this moment, astonished... Look, I, I can't leave this specimen at the moment. Why don't you go up the tower and have a look? It sounds very spectacular. Sure it is. Some tobacco company probably found a new way to light up the sky to sell more cigarettes. Where did you hide it this time? It's in the cupboard. It's always in the same cupboard. I was, um... I was hoping we could get back to dissecting that stingray this evening. Here we go again. The subject is Tom Goodwin, brilliant marine biologist. I'm bored with stingrays. I really don't care why a stingray stings. What do you care about, Tom? You really want me to tell you? You know, sooner or later you're going to have to face the facts. Day and night, drunk or sober. In a lecture room or a lab or a deserted lighthouse off the coast of Cornwall. The hell with it. Meteors and all, who cares? I care what happens to us. Karen, you're a, you're a nice girl. Heaven knows how you talked yourself into marrying me. All right. What do you want us to do? I don't know what you want to do, but well, I want to get away from this island. Look, all this pretense of doing important experiments. It was your idea, remember? Six months away from the university, a time to do field work. Oh, let's get out of here! Look, let me go back where I can buy a bottle of scotch whenever I feel like and not wait for a rotten boat to bring me a single bottle every seven days. What about the equipment? Leave it. What about the fish? Oh, throw them back in the sea! Fine. We'll, we'll leave the island tomorrow. The boat's due in the morning.
Eight. Nine. Nine. <clears throat> Miss Jameson. Hello. 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 Miss Jameson. Dr. Soames. Dr. Soames. Bill Mason. I'm sorry. I just couldn't wait to get those bandages off. You can see, Mason? Yes. But I can't believe what I see. What's happened? Would you please take me to my office? Now try the other eye. You certain the beam is on the pupil? Yes, sir. All right. That's enough. 
Is the blind drawn in here? Yes, sir. Would you be kind enough to pull it up? What is it, Dr. Soames? What's happened? The optic nerves are gone. The glare of the meteorites last night. You are probably one of the few people left in London who can still see this morning, Mason. I don't envy you. I don't think I'd care to see the things that you're likely to see. In the outer office in my desk, you'll find a black leather kit. Would you be good enough to get it for me? Of course. No, it's not there. Ah, here it is. No sign of the boat? No sign of anything. Should have been here hours ago. There's nothing on the radio either. I've been trying all morning. I suppose you're losing valuable drinking time. I'm sorry. Look out. Repeat. The entire population of England appears to be afflicted with blindness as a result of watching the meteorite shower last night. This is the Royal Dockyard at Devonport. A number of naval personnel have escaped blindness. We are trying to set up a rescue centre. All those who are still able to see are urged to make their way to the dockyard. Urgent warning. All of England appears to be infested with a strange new plant that can inflict a fatal sting. It is also rumored that this plant can uproot itself and move about. If you are blind, stay indoors. If you can see, keep a constant lookout. We will return to the air with further bulletins. Stay tuned to this wavelength. Blindness. Men killing plants. I'm not drunk, am I? Wish you were. And how do we get off this island? Where would we go?
are still trying to reach the police. Please remain calm. Do not move about. The only danger is that you will injure yourselves or accidentally start fire. Do not smoke. Do not light matches. Stay clear of all electrical equipment. We are doing everything possible to get help. We will are any trains running? I don't know. Suddenly it went dark and I can't see. Can you help me, sir? Please, Someone can you help sees. me? Beg pardon, sir. You help me Excuse out. Excuse me, sir. I couldn't help overhearing. If you could just tell me to a taxi. If you could just make a telephone call for me to my I'd wife. I'm happy to pay. Please help us out, Matt, sir. I'm sorry. There are no taxis. And the phones don't work. All by yourself? I was in the luggage van. What are you doing in there? I ran away from that stupid boarding school. Where are your parents? I haven't any. I'm part of an estate. The bank in London takes care of me. Well, the banks are closed. Why is she barking? I don't know. Come on, we find out.
Let's see if we can find some rocks. Come on. I can understand French. I can. What's he saying? All services stopped. Yeah. We'll continue sending as long as he can. That's a big help. In, please. S.S. Midman calling. Mayday. Is the captain here? Yes. What is it? The passengers have started to panic, sir. Can't you contact the doctor? No, sir. This is the captain speaking. Attention all passengers. There is no one on board who can help you. We're radioing for a rescue vessel. The only immediate danger is that you may injure yourselves by moving around. Everyone, stay where you are. And if there is anyone who can see, even a child, please, come up on the bridge. Radio Tokyo desu. Kuchirawa Radio Tokyo desu. Tadamachi Dakkaji desu. Minna-sama wa... 
I'm coming with you. Keep behind me. There's no sense in getting killed by a plant. I thought you didn't care what happened to you anymore. I don't. But I picked a much pleasanter way to die. It was 
here. I know it was here. Come on, let's get back inside. itself with its millions of helpless inhabitants has become dangerous. This will be our last broadcast. There is no one here who can see. There is no one left. There's nothing, Bill. Lost, aren't we, Bill? Let me see that map again. Bill, look. Oh, thank goodness, Mr. Corker. But you are not Mr. Corker. You can see. You do. Well, do you live near here? Five kilometers. Well, show us the way. Mr. Corker, this is Mr. Mason and Susan. Hello. Oh, you found some more? Miss Corker, this is Mr. Mason and Susan. How do you do, Miss Corker? They can see. Oh, good. I do hope you'll stay and help us. people do you have here? About 40. But you must be very hungry. My sister and I were touring France. We collided with Mr. Rand's car. Both our cars were ruined. No one was badly hurt. But we were all three under sedation that night. Thanks to Mr. Rand, the shutter became a hospital. Yes, a tragic irony. The sick stayed well, and the healthy became blind. Your daughter is very sleepy. Huh? Come along, my dear. Good night, Daddy. How old is your daughter, Mr. Mason? Well, 
Susan is not my daughter. We found each other in London, and since then, we've sort of been stuck with each other. There's nothing to be afraid of. We're all friends here. Bettina, I want you to meet Susan. She's an English girl who's just arrived. Hello, Susan. Hello. I brought her to you, Bettina, because she still feels strange here, and you speak English. I'll call by later and tuck you in. But you can see. How can you tell? I'm finding I can tell a good many things. I think it's the way people react when you touch them. Let's see if I can tell anything more about you. Can you tell how old I am? You're 13. I'm only 12. But you're a very grown-up 12, aren't you? I think I am. <laughs> Curly, blonde hair, right? Right. And brown eyes? That's right. <laughs> and you've got a good sense of humor, too. I can tell because you've got the nicest love lines around your mouth. I'll tell you something else, too. We're going to be good friends. Until things get back to normal, you are welcome to stay here and help us. In the past few days, I've seen London, Paris, and a lot in between. Things are never going back to normal. So I've tried to impress on Miss Durant. I have faith, Mr. Miss. Faith is fine, Miss Durant. But we'll need a lot more than that if we're going to survive. Why shouldn't we survive? Well, in France alone, there's over 50 million people, almost every one of them blind. There's going to be starvation, fire, pestilence. Anyone caught in the middle of it doesn't stand a chance. I think we ought to get out of here and go on to Spain. How can you know it's any better there? I don't. And even so, how could we get all the people there? We couldn't. Mr. Mason, you are just running away. Look, Mr. Ryan. I told you what things are like. If you sit here with your eyes closed and let this thing run over you, you're the one who's running away. Perhaps you'll change your mind. I hope you and Susan will decide to stay and help us. Good night. Good night. A warm, generous-hearted woman, but I'm afraid very stubborn. They've got the electricity going. Who turned all the lights on? Oh, what did happen, Mr. Coker? Friends is back to normal. Maybe I can reach someone on the phone. They have the lights on? Yes, isn't it wonderful? Hello? Hello? I'm afraid you won't get an answer, Mr. Ryan. Why are you so sure I won't get an answer? I put some fuel in the auxiliary motor for the generator, and as long as it lasts, we'll have light. But there's nothing I can do about the phone. Good to see you working again, Tom. I assure you, it's not for the greater glory of science. I just want us to survive. We will. 
Damn it all, I'm not even a botanist. Is it a plant or an animal? Who knows? It doesn't seem to have any central nervous system. No circulation. Then how does it move? All plants move. They don't usually pull themselves out of the ground and chase you. We could find out how this thing functions. We might figure out an easier way of killing it. Look, you must get some sleep. There's no time. Just an hour. Then I'll wake you, I promise. Well, it got out. They regenerate. It's like animals, like worms. Cut them in half and you can't kill them. There's no telling how many of them are out there. Get the hammer and nails. Thank you. 
coffin. Bettina, what are you doing out here? I wanted to talk to you, Mr. Mason. But you shouldn't be wandering around by yourself. But I had to talk to you, just for a minute. Is it true you're going to leave us? To go to Spain? Yes. But what about the rest of us? Bettina, the only way I can help is to try to find some real help. And I can't do it by staying here. Then you're coming back to us? Yes. If I can. I hope you do come back. Come on, I better get you back inside. original Triffid, the kind I saw in a greenhouse several years ago, was known to have come to Earth in a meteorite. This reappearance must have been caused by the meteorite explosion of the other night. Why should they attack people? Most plants thrive on animal waste, but I'm afraid this mutation possesses an appetite for the animal itself. This must be how they propagate. There are millions of them. One light wind and they're everywhere. Susan, where's Miss Durant? In there. Bill, wait. There's something I've got to tell you. Later, Susan. Miss Durant. Give me a moment, Mr. Mason. Please sit down. Now, look, Mr. Durant. Now, whether you like it or not, we're going to have to pack up and leave. Did you bring some more supplies? You tell him, Mr. Coker. Mason's quite right, Mr. Durant. In the next 24 hours, the vicinity will be swarming with triffids. But I cannot leave all these people here to die. I grew up with them. They are my friends. Don't you understand? Listen. Bill, it's that plane again. It's back. It flew over here before, Bill. That's what I wanted to tell you. Come on, Coker. saying something about Toulon, the naval base being a rescue center. Toulon? 
course, the French base in the Mediterranean near Marseille. Yes. He's dead. girls in there and made them dance with them. They brought all kinds of food and whiskey. Well, how many are there? I don't know, but there's a lot. And they can see? Yes. Where's Miss Durant? She's in there with them. But, Bill, they said they'd kill anyone who... Stay here and lock all the doors. But don't open for anyone but me, hmm?
Gooden. Get up there to the side. Thing I said to you back to the chateau, I had no right to say them. Well, if it makes you feel any better. I probably would have said the same thing under the circumstances. You're guilty, hmm? Maybe. You know why? Why? Because you survived. Bettina, Coker, and all the rest dead. And you're alive, and you wonder why. That's exactly right. Yeah, I know the feeling. In the war, you get a ship shot up from underneath you. All your friends gone, only a handful left. And you ask yourself, why me? Why not someone better? Where will we go in Spain? Well, there's a big American naval base in southern Spain, the Cadiz. They're equipped for disaster. They get supplies, the discipline. So where are the French at Toulon? Nitric acid solution, negative. It's not that I expected a miracle. I didn't think we'd find a magic bullet, but nothing, absolutely nothing seems to affect this tissue. They live, they grow, they take nourishment. They have sensory response, they absorb and expend energy. No matter what they're made of, there must be something that'll interrupt their life cycle. Well, fundamentally, it's a, a simple problem. Like finding a weed killer. No help out there. Been nothing on the air for days. Can't help thinking about that last radio call from Devonport. The way the place caught fire and blew up like that, it was... It was like listening to the end of the world. Well, it's not the end of the world. Not quite yet. There's an answer here in front of us. There has to be. to find the answer. We'd better find it pretty soon. What are they doing now? They're staring in at us like guards outside a condemned cell. Well, let's get through this checklist again. Right. find something we're going to eat right away, hmm? <gasps> oh, I'm 
sorry. Did I burn you? No, it's, it's nothing. Bill, hmm? do you think we have a chance? Once you taste this coffee of mine, you'll know nothing worse can happen. Your coffee is very good. In fact, you're a handy man in the kitchen. Been doing for myself for a long time. You have never been married? No. Why? Guess I've never been one spot long enough to get caught. And now you are saddled with a family. It might have its points. somewhere. He'll have plenty of food. He'll be fine. No, he can't leave him all alone. I won't go. Now, Susan, be reasonable. We can't take him with us. Don't let him, Christine. He doesn't care. It's mean. He doesn't have any right. But it is not Bill's fault, Susan. He's only doing what's right for all of us. He'll never hurt you. Never. If he can't help it. You know that. I think so. I knew it. That's my role. Luis de la Vega. I'm Bill Mason. This is Susan and Mr. Rapp. But please. Teresa, three guests. This is my wife, Teresa. Welcome. Now we know that we are not the only two people left in this part of the world. I believe that someone with a right to help us. Why I put up the rock. You see, we are expecting a baby and we need someone who can help. Perhaps the two ladies could. You can't see. Both seem so natural. My wife has been blind for many years. Now she's teaching me how to get around. But you ladies will stay and help her. Of course we will. Please, please be seated, all of you. I'll go and get some food. We'll help. Come along, Susan. We were trying to get to Cadiz. But you don't know about that. Know about what? They had to evacuate the naval base. Well, they did? How? Uh, by submarine. I, I heard it on my radio. Some submarines that were submerged during the night of the meteorites, their entire crews were all right. I tried to contact them with my transmitter, but something went wrong. I can neither transmit nor receive. Well, let's take a look at it. Maybe I can fix it. Oh, are you familiar? Yes. As the first mate, I'd have to at least have a working knowledge of it.
from the Gibraltar Rescue Center. Final survivor pickup will be on Saturday at Alicante. We repeat our warning. Vast bands of triffids are roaming the area. Do not travel at night. Barricade all doors. We repeat our warning. Do not travel at night. Barricade all doors. Final survivor pickup will be on Saturday at Alicante. But it's tomorrow. We'll leave the first thing in the morning. I suppose that's to be expected. Mm. Hey, that's Susan.
do they keep coming back? Uh, I don't know, Susan. Well, there must be some reason. Maybe they can hear us. Hmm? Hey, maybe that's it. Maybe it's sound that attracts them. That generator. Come on, Susan. and take off. But until then, no noise at all. All right? Now, come on. What about you? I'll see you in Al County. When is up, hmm? We're the submarine will depart in five minutes. Our light rafts will continue to search for survivors.
This is the Gibraltar Rescue Center for the Mediterranean area. Our pickup at Alicante has been made on schedule. This is the final rescue operation for the present. Stay tuned to this wavelength for further bulletins. Repeat. Stay tuned to this wavelength for further bulletins. How far is Gibraltar? Too far to swim. Let's get back to work. Get away from that window. Stop staring at them.
of the earth is covered with it. You hunt and you search, and all the while the answer's right in front of you. A simple method had been found to destroy the triffids. Sea water, from which life on earth had sprung, became the means of preserving life on earth. Mankind survived, and once again had reason to give thanks. Welcome back to the Schlocky Horror Picture Show and tonight's film fertiliser, The Day of the Triffids. Not since those immortal words, we want a shrubbery, have plants been so scary. The Day of the Triffids was a post-apocalyptic novel written in 1951 by John Wyndham and turned into a script by Bernard Gordon, who had written Earth vs. the Flying Saucers and Krakatoa, East of Java. Actually, I've always meant to talk to Bernie about that script because Krakatoa was definitely west of Java. Until it blew up, at least. Then it was in all directions. But I digress. The Day of the Triffids was directed by Steve Seekley, who was best known for directing women in bondage films like Hitler's Women and Revenge of the Zombies. He was forced to share directorial credit with David Lynch's favourite cinematographer, Freddie Francis, who was behind the camera on Dune, Dracula Has Risen from the Grave, The Elephant Man, The Evil of Frankenstein, The Innocents, The Deadly Bees, The Creeping Flesh, The Ghoul, The Expired Milk, The Steaming Teapot, and perhaps scariest of all, Black Beauty. Freddie directed the lighthouse scenes, an afterthought of the producers who believed the film needed a totally unrelated subplot, a good dose of action and a happy ending. The Day of the Triffid stars Howard Keel, who was better known as the John Wayne of movie musicals. His obvious, um, talent in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, Calamity Jane and Showboat had women swooning in the aisles and the men exiting the same way. In the day of the Triffids, Howard plays sailor Bill Mason, hospitalised after being temporarily blinded in an accident, thus missing both the most spectacular act of God since Sodom and Gomorrah and a chance for a dance spectacular. After a few less than notable westerns, Keel disappeared into the relative obscurity of the television guest star circuit, including The Love Boat, Fantasy Island and Here's Lucy, before finding a decade of steady work in Dallas as Clayton Farlow, Miss Ellie's second husband. He started appearing in concert as a result of his renewed fame and landed his first solo recording contract with And I Love You So in 1983. On second thoughts, perhaps he should become plant food. Mr. Keel plays the protective fatherly hero to 14-year-old Susan, portrayed by Janina Fay. Fay also appeared as a deaf mute in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and she's no better tonight with all her senses. The compulsory love interest in tonight's Salad of Doom is Nicole Maury, a glamorous French beauty who had some Hollywood success in the 1950s, a time when being French wasn't frowned upon. Times changed, so she returned home and enjoyed a long career ending in the late 1990s. But I really got hot when I saw Janet Scott fight a Trifford that spits poison and kills. Okay, I know, but somebody had to say it eventually. I doubt anyone would know who Jeanette Scott was if it wasn't for the opening song of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's certainly not for being the ex-wife of crooner Mel Torme, or for appearing in School for Scoundrels or Helen of Troy, or even as a scientist in Crack in the World. The last time I saw her was in the 2008 Simon Pegg comedy, How to Lose Friends and Alienate People. But I won't mention that as I don't want to lose friends or alienate people. 
The day of the Triffids sees Jeanette as the long-suffering Karen Goodwin, one half of the overplayed, lighthouse-bound husband-wife scientist team. Hubby Tom Goodwin is played by Kieran Moore, definitely a long way from his Heathcliff days or his more earnest failure as Count Vronsky opposite Vivian Lee's Anna Karenina. He also appeared in Dr. Blood's Coffin, playing the contents of the coffin, and as a scientist in Crack in the World, this time not married to Jeanette. Kieran's final film was 1968's Run Like a Thief, which is good advice, but a little too late. There are many other reasons to watch The Day of the Triffids. Prolific Aussie actor John Tate, father of not-so-prolific Mick Tate, Carol Ann Ford from the Doctor Who movies, Alison Leggett from A Tale of Two Cities, Jeffrey Matthews from Coronation Street. You don't even have time to check the fridge for unknown vegetable matter at the back of the crisper. Stand by. Here comes the late afternoon of the Triffids. Now you know why I'm a vegetarian. Not because I love animals, it's because I really hate plants. For mere flying chunks of rock, filmmakers really do give meteors a lot of credit when it comes to the end of civilization as we know it. And the happy ending does stretch credulity a bit far. I mean, who would have thought that Triffids, which thrive on the salt-ravaged sea-sprayed rocks of the lighthouse, could be so easily destroyed by salt water? Good thing they dissolve away and are so easy to dispose of. The Triffids themselves are somewhat cheesy when compared to the 1981 BBC drama based on the same book, but that actually adds to the fun. And there are some fun moments, such as the wires pulling the Triffids along the ground, especially obvious when one of them chases Susan. And when the security guard is killed, you can see the Triffids moving towards him on wheels. We didn't see vegetables this mobile again until Attack of the Killer Tomatoes in 1978. I also like the final shot of the Triffids approaching Bill as he's driving the truck with the tinny music, in which the operator's sneakers can be seen pushing the Triffids towards the camera. However, that scene did leave me with a deathly fear of ice cream vans, or soft serverphobia as it's known. Please join me next week when I fish out more celluloid slop from the wheelie bin behind Fox Studios and force feed it to you without a spoon, all in the name of art, for the schlocky horror picture show. Toodles! <laughs>